Watch us on YouTube and Facebook. Listen to our podcast and support us on Patreon. Thanks for stopping by. Since the recent rejuvenation of intuition research within the management literature, significant work has been done on conceptualizing intuition. Whilst remarkable progress has been achieved in many areas of intuition, the role of intuition in creativity remains comparatively under-researched. Through an extensive review of intuition literature, we believe that a reason for this could be that intuition in the management literature is generally conceptualized as judgment. We aim to extend our understanding of intuition in creativity by distinguishing between intuitive judgment and intuitive insight on literature-based features of intuition and the conceptual model of knowledge types, distinction of focal and subsidiary awareness. These considerations lead us to propose that there are two distinct kinds of intuition, intuitive judgment and intuitive insight. Introducing the distinction between intuitive insight and intuitive judgment. The significance of distinguishing between these two concepts is that it provides us with a better understanding of the role of intuition in creativity which is the least understood and researched area of intuition in management research. Therefore, our findings help elucidate a better understanding of creativity, and thus extend our knowledge of intuition. Moreover, this is potentially valuable to knowledge-oriented organizations who place considerable emphasis on creativity, not only in the area of R&D but also in a wide variety of business functions. In order to fully understand the rationale presented, relevant literature is examined literature beyond management research about the use of intuition in creativity, philosophy, psychology, amongst others, four helpful supplementary models. One suggests that intuition lies at the heart of a number of dual process theories of cognition. These dual process theories came about since cognition appeared to be difficult to understand as a unitary construct. There are many variants of the dual process theories, each with slightly different versions of duality. The roots of this duality can be traced back to Socrates, Plato and Aristotle in the Western world. The first well-known one from the modern era is Freud's in 1900 The Distinction of Primary and Secondary Mental Operations, to finally propose the dualism of sequential versus mal. Typal processing. Some more recent dualist conceptions include the extensional versus intuitive reason, controlled versus intuitive mode of cognitive function, and reasoning versus intuition, rational versus experimental, which is later referred to as analytical rational versus intuitive experimental. Without trying to list all the different versions of the dual process theories, a review of models can be found do we indicate that they always distinguish between a process that comes close to intuiting and another which we can best describe as non-intuitive regardless of which version of the dual process theories one accepts. The duality of intuitive and non-intuitive processing seems to have been widely recognized. The importance of this duality for management, apart from good logical analysis, intuition, is nowhere more indispensable than in executive arts. Research on intuition became increasingly popular in the last two decades in the management literature and in the academic world more generally. We see two reasons for this. One, intuition, is the perhaps least understood aspect of managerial cognition. Without understanding intuition it is impossible to develop any meaningful conceptualization of cognition. Intuition is of the very raison d'etre of the problem of cognition. Thus the only consistent way of avoiding the problem of intuition would be to deny it completely, which would, in turn, mean denying the problem and the phenomenon of consciousness itself. Examining the conceptualization of knowledge, sleeping monster, which, once awakened, may destroy our view of knowledge. Altogether, 
However, we believe that if it is destructive trying to understand intuition then, destruction is needed, as our view of knowledge and consciousness cannot be meaningful unless it accounts for intuition as well. We propose a provisional distinction of two types of intuition, which we call intuitive judgment and intuitive insight. This distinction helps us in developing a better understanding of creative intuition, which is perhaps the least understood of the various types of intuition. We believe that offering this conceptualization contributes towards the overall goal of improving our understanding of intuition more generally. In the first case that we examined the nature of personal knowledge to identify different knowledge types. We started from distinction of knowing that and knowing how, to which we added three further types. We concluded that both the know why and the know what belong to intuition. In the second case we surveyed the literature and identified a set of six features which define intuitive knowledge. These six features of intuition resemble closely those of others. Three of these apply to the process of intuiting and three to the outcome of such a process, the intuitive knowledge. Intuiting is rapid, often labeled instantaneous, spontaneous, does not require effort, and cannot be deliberately controlled, and a logical, a meaning that it does not necessarily contradict the rules of logic, but does not follow them either. The outcome of the intuitive process is tacit in that the intuitives cannot give account of how they arrived at the results, holistic but also often called gestalt, as it is concerned with the totality of a situation rather than parts of it. And the intuitor feels confident about their intuition, with no apparent reason in terms of evidence. Alongside this process of searching for the features of intuition, we have recognized that all the reports, whether academic or practitioner, from a variety of fields, including management, psychology, and philosophy, as well as reports from artists and scientists from diverse fields, mention two major areas in which intuition is used, namely decision-taking and creative problem-solving. Based on the above, we challenge one of the underlying assumptions of the vast majority of intuition research in the field of management, namely that all intuition is judgment. As many of the management scholars interested in intuition are coming from the discipline of decision-making taking, this assumption appears to be taken for granted, so much so that it is usually not explicitly stated. However, we believe that this implicit presumption limits our understanding of intuition, which is particularly salient in the case of creative intuition. As we will show, distinguishing between intuitive judgment and intuitive insight does not contradict any of the findings arrived at when considering intuition as judgment, rather it adds an extra dimension to the previously suggested typologies and thus offers a richer picture of intuition. It also does not directly contradict the distinction between intuition and insight, instead it refines the distinction, namely there is intuitive and non-intuitive insight, just as there is intuitive and non-intuitive judgment. We are not introducing a superfluous concept in an area which is already rid de led with models and constructs. Instead we believe that based on previous research the distinct tie-on between intuitive judgment and intuitive insight can help us achieve a more nuanced and comprehensive picture of intuition. Although we agree with that intellect cannot completely understand the intuition since the artificial tools, preconceived categories and symbols used by the intellect only represent reality and are not the substance of reality. We believe that it is important to try from an intuitive understanding of intuition, to extract and logically develop concepts. We establish intuition as a form of knowledge, emphasizing that in this research we are only interested in intuition as it operates at high levels of expertise, providing scope and focus. Then we attempt to describe the process of intuiting, 
For this we need to first briefly revisit the concepts of focal and subsidiary awareness. Finally, we introduce our idea of distinguishing between intuitive judgment and intuitive insight, offering it as an additional viewpoint in the ongoing development of the conceptual framework for intuition research. We illustrate how they can be integrated into the existing typologies as a new dimension. Inspiration comes only to the prepared mind. In terms of knowing, we can use our knowledge to understand something through analytical step-by-step -step reasoning, comparing and contrasting alternatives evaluating them, examining their characteristics, the associated costs, and benefits. Such step-by-step -step reasoning is not the only way of knowing. Intuitive knowledge is often described by scientists and decision-takers too. They just know, in a moment without knowing how or why they'd know. The knowledge arrived at by means of intuiting we call intuitive knowledge. Based on an examination of a wide range of literature, for example social and cognitive psychology, history and philosophy of science, education, validity of intuitive knowledge. Conceptualizing intuition as intuitive knowledge, limiting the scope of the intuition field, enables us to apply the domain of knowledge to the domain of intuition. Intuition worthy of trust appears to be experienced by experts, and thus we limit our research to expert intuition. In spite of the large number of reports and studies in favor of intuition, it was not fully explored systematically in the mainstream academic literature until recently. The reason is probably that we prefer explicit knowledge obtained through well-defined, if possible standardized, procedures, and conversely we mistrust intuitive knowledge obtained through ad hoc. However this perception has changed and more researchers are now recognizing that the deliberative conscious reasoning is not the only way of arriving at valid knowledge. This does not mean that scientists have not used their intuition before, only typically they pretended that new knowledge has always been arrived at by the established scientific method of the time. Nevertheless, for decades there have been philosophers and scientists turned philosophers, fighting to establish intuition as a valid form of knowledge. After building up reputation in the accepted mainstream psychology, argue for the important role of intuition particularly in considering the most significant scientific achievements. Reaching for knowledge with the right hand is science. Yet to say only that much of science is to overlook one of its excitements, for the great hypotheses of science are gifts carried in the left hand. Emphasize that it is usually the most esteemed scientists who earn the label intuitive which in itself is strong evidence that scientists find intuition valuable, opinion or imagination, reason, intuitive knowledge, and without much explanation. Intuitive knowledge is the most powerful of the three, thinking, feeling, sensation, and intuition. Intuition is a superior form of knowledge, no complex thought can be arrived at other than by means of intuiting the role of intuition of helping to arrive at new ideas, after which we should abandon intuition, and work on building the body of knowledge using the new intuitively obtained knowledge. Once we start feeling lost, we should get in touch with our intuition again, often undoing what we have done in the deliberative phase, and so forth in cycles. Intuition as a method, particularly in metaphysics, and in areas of complex, dynamic, and abstract thinking, contrasting intuition to intellect. It must be noted that identifying intuition with intuitive knowledge is a limitation. We do not intend neglecting intuition outside the area of knowledge, however this constraint helps provide a focus. Moreover it must be acknowledged that intuition also appears in feelings and emotions. The physical, the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual. Extending the examination of intuition to the other three faculties can foster a deeper understanding as well as explain the somatic charges often reported about intuition.
we have focused on this multipotential aspect of intuition, and more generally of cognition. Intuition at high levels of expertise. When reviewing the literature on intuition, we initially believe that there is an additional feature, namely that intuition only appears where high levels of expertise exist. Some authors consider expert intuition as particular type of intuition. We briefly analyze these two considerations in order to illustrate why we view expertise as something that characterizes valuable intuition rather than being a type of intuition in its own right and based on this examination limit our focus to intuition of experts. Distinguish between expert intuition and entrepreneurial intuition. The former is past pattern oriented, thus the experts almost spontaneously apply their existing knowledge in a familiar or similar to familiar situation. On the contrary, the latter is supposedly future and change oriented, thus the ability to make novel connections and discern. The problem with this distinction is that the proposed two kinds of intuition reside in different dimensions. We can have different levels of expertise and we can be entrepreneurial to varying degrees. Possible relationship is that one needs certain minimal level of expertise to be entrepreneurial in any field, and that higher level of knowledge means better entrepreneurship. Distinguish between holistic hunch and automated expertise. The first a corresponds to judgment or choice made through a subconscious synthesis drawn from diverse experiences whilst the second is the merely the subconscious application of learned rules. Of course, for the holistic hunch to be able to synthesize information from diverse experiences, that information needs to be there. This simple distinction cannot be maintained. It is also a well-known phenomenon that experts will not only be able to handle situations they have already experienced or for what they have learned rules, but will also be able to go beyond the existing knowledge. Whilst many researchers consider intuition useful, other scholars argue fiercely against it. That is those who have provided experimental evidence on the failure of intuition, we will see that many of them have examined novices' intuitions. Undergraduate students of business administration make poor intuitive judgments in the field of physics. Those who have found intuition useful in their respective fields of research in leadership typically focused on expert intuition. As empirical and particular Particularly the experimental evidence in the area of intuition in management is relatively scarce. The previous argument is not conclusive, but the findings appear to illustrate that expertise contributes to effective intuition. What certainly appears to be the case is that intuition, at least good intuition, appears where there is high level of expertise. This, however, does not help in distinguishing intuition from non-intuition. Even though one can learn certain analytical steps and apply them at a low level of expertise, higher level of expertise certainly entails both better intuition and better analysis. But there is something important about the relationship between intuition and the level of expertise. To approach the relationship between intuition and expertise from a different angle, it is possible to start from the research on levels of knowledge. There are three distinct streams of research on knowledge levels with very different approaches. Simon with various colleagues used primarily experimental approaches, supplemented with verbal reports, adopted phenomenological observations in various natural contexts, applied conceptual modeling based on a geometrical analogy, all these researchers argue that when one achieves a high level of expertise, intuition naturally emerges, and at the highest level it becomes the dominant form of knowledge. Therefore we agree that, that expertise is an antecedent to trustworthy intuition, and hence we are only interested in intuition in those with a high level of expertise. Having established intuitive knowledge as a valid form of knowledge we limit the scope and narrow the focus, focusing on intuition as knowledge and intuiting as knowing respectively. 
where considerable expertise is held, distinguishing between intuitive judgment and intuitive insight as two meaningful forms of intuitive knowledge. We need to look more closely at intuition at work, how the process of intuiting is structured. Intuition is at best regarded as mysterious and unexplainable. We do not understand its cognitive architecture. We should first become familiar with this mysterious process of intuition. We aim to shed some light on what lies behind the mystery for the two forms of intuition. All tacit knowing can be explained on the basis of focal and subsidiary components, and that, in turn, all knowing is, at least partly, tacit. When hammering in a nail, we are differently aware of the hammer and of the nail. What is the focus of our act, the driving in the nail, which is supported by the subsidiary? Awareness of everything else, a feeling in our palm, hammer, etc. To help in conceptualizing the process of intuiting, we will review two kinds of awareness and the related concepts of focal and subsidiary and knowing. We will apply the distinction of focal and subsidiary to intuition and intuiting which will help us explain the structure of intuiting. We are aware of the proximal term of an act of tacit knowing in the appearance of its distal term. We are aware of that from which we are attending to another thing, in the appearance of that thing. For further clarification the use of these terms is illustrated through an example. If we try with our eyes closed to use a stick to explore a room, initially we will concentrate on the end of the stick in our hand, more precisely, on the feelings experienced in our fingers thus concentrating on the near end, proximal term, of the stick. Even though we are really interested in what is at the far end of the stick, a distal term, the room. However, after a short period, we forget about the stick in our hand and start picturing the room's layout. This is what is meant by attending from the proximal to the distal. We are differently aware of proximal and distal. The awareness of the distal vocal, as it is in the focus, and the awareness of the proximal subsidiary. In the previous case, the room is in the focus, and we have subsidiary. Awareness of the feelings in palm, vibrations, etc. Meaning of the text is in the focus, and the letters, grammatical rules, etc. are in the subsidiary awareness. We can see that knowing the proximal is usually tacit, as our subsidiary awareness of a thing may not suffice to make it identifiable for whilst knowing the distal is always explicit, as a focal awareness is always conscious. What is in focus requires focal attention, and that kind of attention can be paid only to one thing at a time. This also means that the rest of the 7 plus or minus 2 slots in the working memory can only belong to the subsidiary attention. This also fits the previous examples about exploring the room and writing. We can pay focal attention to one whole entity, the single distal term, and subsidiary attention to multiple particulars, i.e. several proximal terms. The above discussion of focal and subsidiary awareness follows from the literature. However, to apply the same line of thinking to intuition is not straightforward. Therefore we use the more overarching concept of a knowledge instead of intuition to facilitate this exploration as we limited the notion of intuition to intuitive knowledge what applies to all knowledge knowing should also apply to the intuitive subset of knowledge knowing. Although there are various conceptualizations of the distinction, in the case of personal knowledge, as opposed to organizational knowledge, all these authors agree that knowledge is mental content. Knowing is then seen as a process through which knowledge is used, such as learning, thinking or applying knowledge. In considering again the example of writing, this time from the viewpoint of explicit and tacit knowledge, letters, words and rules of grammar belong to the explicit domain, learned in the classroom. However we cannot teach in the classroom how to write a good poem, i.e. it belongs to the domain of tacit knowledge. As it was said previously, 
letters, words and the rules of grammar are the particulars, proximal term, subsidiary attention, whilst the poem corresponds to the whole entity, distal term, focal attention. The subsidiary knowledge is explicit, and the focal knowledge is tacit. We established that in terms of knowing, the distal is characterized by explicit knowing, and the proximal is characterized by tacit knowing. So, the tacit explicit relation now appears to be reversed. We have identified an interesting contrast between knowledge and knowing. Whilst we can explicitly identify what we are focusing on focal knowing, we are unable to actually provide an explicit description of this content focal knowledge. This corresponds to being able to say that we are writing a good a poem, but this does not mean that we can put into words what a good poem is. We usually cannot identify the particulars of the subsidiary attention, a subsidiary knowing. If someone would point these out for us, we might be able to provide an explicit account about the content of these particulars, subsidiary knowledge. We cannot say which letters and rules of grammar we use when writing the poem, but, if someone asked about them, we could explain them explicitly. The root cause of the difference is that tacit explicit knowledge refers to the nature of the content, whilst the tacit explicit knowing is about identifying this content. So what we focus on can be characterized by tacit knowledge and explicit knowing whilst our subsidiary awareness is characterized by explicit knowledge and tacit knowing. We apply these findings to intuition, intuitive knowledge, and intuiting process of intuitive knowing in order to understand the structure of intuiting. We describe a characteristic, which leads to an apparent contradiction, this contradiction together with the focal subsidiary distinction serve as the starting point for understanding the structure of intuiting. Intuition is arrived at without the use of analytic methods or calculation. Non-linear mode of thinking, non-logical, to contrast it to the logical process of analytical reasoning, knowledge gained without rational thought. Although the terminology is slightly different, in every case the message is that intuiting operates independently of the general principles of logic. We call this mode of operation a logical, meaning that it neither follows logical nor contradicts the illogical, the rules of logic. Intuition and analysis are not operating independent of each other, but rather in a complementary manner. Intuition and judgment, at least good judgment, are simply analyses frozen into habit and into the capacity for rapid response through recognition. Intuition is about synthesis, and synthesis can never be derived from analyses. It seems reasonable to ask whether this apparent contradiction can be resolved. Intuition, as experts recognizing patterns relevant to their experience, intuition includes synthesis, and this is completely consistent with the view of intuition as pattern recognition. Analyses frozen into habit. Analysis here may not mean the opposite of synthesis, but the opposite of intuition, which seems plausible from the previous quote. This would meant that the non-intuitions frozen into habit, constituting intuition. We explore whether it is possible to understand how these non-intuitions may constitute intuition by applying to intuition intuiting what we have discussed about knowledge knowing in terms of the focal subsidiary distinction. Intuition can usually be decomposed into its constituents, and by doing so the intuitor can arrive at a logical explanation of the intuitive outcome. By combining the two descriptions, it is possible to gain a better understanding of intuition. The distal term that we pay focal attention to is the focal intuition intuiting. It corresponds to the whole entity, the room we are exploring using a stick, and the meaning of the text when writing. The focal intuition is tacit and illogical, and the focal intuiting is explicit and logy. As we can identify the outcome of intuiting, we can accept that focal intuiting is explicit, and as its content cannot be taught in a classroom setting, 
the focal intuition is considered tacit. The proximal term of intuition, what we pay subsidiary attention to, is the subsidiary intuition intuiting, at the near end of the stick when exploring the room or the knowledge of letters and grammar when writing a poem. We expect that the subsidiary intuition is logical and can be put into words as it could be taught in a classroom setting, and that the subsidiary intuiting is tacit and illogical, as we cannot identify the particulars. Of course, we could pay attention to the particulars, only then we would probably lose the sight of the whole entity and focus upon a particular aspect. If we focus on the whole entity the particulars get submerged. What we have not explained so far is how the subsidiary particulars come together into the whole entity on which we focus in the process of intuiting. Particulars fuse into the whole entity as long as the person sustains it. Integration and extends the concept of tacit knowing to this integrative process. What is subsidiarily known is tacitly known, but it seems appropriate to extend the meaning of a tacit knowing to include the integration of subsidiary to focal knowing. The structure of tacit knowing is then the structure of this integrative process, and knowing is tacit to the extent to which it has such a structure. For better understanding of subsidiary intuition, we need to figure out what the particulars are. These are the components of the explanation. This is why it always has to be obtained afterwards. There can be rules that are to follow and a methods that are to apply, but they have little to do with how we arrived at the intuitive knowledge. We might have used some of the rules or methods, only they have undergone a tacit process of integration and thus we cannot identify them. We have used the example of jokes which are logical with hindsight, but only with hindsight. The rules and the methods cannot conjure the intuitive leap, but once we have arrived at the intuitive outcome, we may use them to explain it. Now that we have described the intuitive process in terms of the particulars going through a tacit process of integration we put forward that we can conceptualize two distinct types of intuition. These are sufficiently similar to identify both as intuition but at the same time, sufficiently different to distinguish between them. One of the insights that emerged on the features of intuition, was that most if not all accounts of intuitive knowledge can be located in one of two areas, decision-taking, and creativity. We came to the same conclusion through building a conceptual model of the types of knowledge, whilst not being sufficient grounds for a conclusive inference that there are only two different kinds of intuition, this insight became the starting point of this inquiry. However, in order to build a more solid foundation we examined in more depth prior empirical and conceptual work. Whilst there are other typologies of intuition in the literature, we adopted a different perspective from these, enabling us to gain a different understanding and which we believe helps move researchers closer to conceptualizing the role of intuition in creative typologies include distinguish problem solving, moral and creative intuitions, differentiate matching, accumulative, and constructive intuitions, to identify problem solving, creative, social, and moral intuitions as primary types, the secondary types being composites of the primary types. The three mentioned examples are very different. They distinguish between various types of intuition, concerned with the processes underlying intuition, offer a typology of intuition types, as well as a model of the processes of intuiting these intuitions. All these distinctions, however, appear to presume that intuition is judgment. Providing substance to our exploration that the decision paradigm of intuition is potentially too narrow to account for a broader picture of intuition. Recognition is our departure point, and extending this narrow framework is what we want to achieve. We will also show that our distinction between intuitive judgment 
and intuitive insight can be added to the existing typologies resulting in a richer picture of intuition. We do not intend to provide a detailed discussion here on intuition specifically focused on intuitive judgment. Instead, we will explore a couple of reference points into a conceptual foundation for delineating the concept of intuitive insight from the concept of intuitive judgment. It transcends the capacity of merely intellectual methods, and the techniques of discriminating the factors of the situation. The terms pertinent to it are a feeling, judgment, sense, proportion, balance, appropriateness. It is a matter of art rather than science, and is aesthetic rather than logical. This is not surprising from observing decision takers, specifically, that they often do not use the tools and techniques taught and described but rather rely on their intuition. In these situations, decision takers use their intuition in producing a judgment. This implies that the role of intuition in generating decision alternatives is not of primary concern. Although it is often noted that intuition may play a role in all phases of the decision process, as the term intuitive judgment is often used, we keep this term, and will use it for the intuition of the decision taker. Intuitive insight by logic we prove, but by intuition we discover. The other part focuses on intuition in creativity. There seems to be a general agreement that intuition is a necessary component of creativity, at least the creation of any great novum, new knowledge, appears to be based on intuition. We are inclined to believe that no significant creative result has been achieved in any other way than by means of intuition. Apart from notable exceptions, intuition in creativity is still viewed as judgment. Naturally, the creative process may involve intuitive judgments, for example judging which path to pursue, however, we argue that there is intuition, which is not judgment, which actually produces the novum in new knowledge. This is what we call intuitive insight. Scientists, artists and philosophers, the use of intuition in creativity and in mathematical discoveries is a rule rather than a curiosum. There cannot be a logical method of having ideas. Every discovery contains a creative intuition. The descriptions of intuition mention all the characteristics of intuition. If we accept that those characteristics define intuition, then what fits the definition has to be considered intuition. Here we take a step back to approach the intuitive insight from the perspective of the insight, as previously we approached it from the perspective of intuition. There are a number of seemingly similar concepts in relation. One of these being insight. Insight refers to the process of arriving at the solution of well-structured problems. Insight, in the context of a well-defined problem, in which people explain the way of arriving at a solution. This solution can be objectively checked for being correct. Solving well-structured problems does not require creating new knowledge. As in the case of judgment, there may be two kinds of insight an intuitive, and a non-intuitive one. Non-intuitive insight is at work in the case of well-structured problems, a typical one being the prisoner in the tower, whilst ill-structured problems call for intuitive insight. Solutions of ill-structured problems arrived at by intuitive insight always have a degree of subjectivity, and even if the creative person can demonstrate the relationships between the parts of the solution, the way of arriving at this solution will remain inexpressible in words or other symbols. We provide three typical examples here for illustration. The solution to a long-standing problem attained through intuitive insight the riddle solved itself could not show the connection between what knew before, what I last used to it and what produced the final success. I've had solutions for a long time but do not yet know how I to arrive at them. There cannot be functions with certain characteristics, Fuchsian functions, forgot about his work and then, in a flash of intuitive insight realized 
that such functions can exist, no verification, no time to do so, but felt absolute certainty at once, trying to explain how music does happen in time, but conceives it as a whole, how they come, no not, nor force them. Sometimes, the creative person cannot even explain the relationships between the parts of the solution. This assertion is illustrated when the relationships are discovered only substantially later, and sometimes by people other than the creator of the novum. We illustrate this with two famous examples from the history of science. The first is an anecdote told by physicists about Dirac's equations, which are usually considered the second most brilliant result of theoretical physics, after Einstein's theory of general relativity. Someone else had to point out to him that his equations actually predicted antimatter, to which Dirac responded, my equations were smarter than I was. The other example is Darwin's 1859 theory of evolution by natural selection. He introduced two concepts that signified only one phenomenon, namely fitness, and natural selection. It was only after Dawkins' 1989 introduction of his selfish genes into the theory of evolution that it became clear that we actually do need two concepts, as we need to talk about the survival of fittest genes whilst the natural selection operates upon the individual members of species. We show that there is a type of insight, which is obtained in a way that demonstrates the features we expect from intuition. This does not contradict the distinction between intuition and insight described as they are distinguishing between intuition and non-intuitive insights. This is very important as the two are similar in many ways and they should not be confused. We, however, are adding a further nuance to this distinction by identifying a version of insight which is intuitive thus also achieving symmetry with judgment which also has intuitive and non-intuitive versions. Once we manage to conceptually delineate intuitive judgment from intuitive insight, we found some traces of similar ideas although these were not elaborated, perhaps most importantly, distinguish a strategic intuition, which points to a direction worth pursuing, and a concluding intuition which gets us to a novum, to a solution of a problem. The first corresponds to intuitive judgment, and the second corresponds to intuitive insight, talks about intuition in decisions and problem solving, particularly example of mathematics to describe intuition in judging whether a solution is correct or an approach to problem can be fruitful, as distinct from intuition, which suddenly reaches a solution. Empirical studies identified three ways in which executives use intuition as an explorer to foresee the correct path to fall. Low, which corresponds to intuitive judgment, as of a synthesizer and integrator, which comes close to intuitive insight and as what might be termed eclectic which is a combination of the previous two. These three works mention uses of intuition, which come close to what we call intuitive judgment and intuitive insight. None of them delineates the two. Ordinary intuition is not clearly specified, and sometimes it appears to be some sort of miscellaneous category. The distinction between expert intuition and a strategic intuition resembles the previously mentioned expert versus entrepreneurial intuition. While some explanations suggest that some things similar to our distinction between intuitive judgment and intuitive insight, choice of category labels is very misleading. When we think of strategy, we normally relate it primarily to decisions who use the same term with a meaning close to intuitive judgment. While we think that there is significant amount of interesting discussions, we see the distinction between intuitive judgment and intuitive insight as an additional dimension to existing typologies. We can have an intuitive moral judgment, classifying an action as good or evil, and we can also create a new moral value through intuitive moral insight, 
for example that all men are born equal. In decision making as well as in creativity we also may find both intuitive judgment and intuitive insight. This is the very reason that it is so problematic to recognize intuitive judgment and intuitive insight as two separate types of intuition. They can rarely be attained in a pure form. An intuitive decision process may not only involve intuitive judgments, but also intuitive insights. Generating decision alternatives may involve creativity, and thus intuitive insight. Conversely, a creative process may involve, apart from intuitive insights, instances of intuitive judgment when choosing in which direction to continue the dominant role in decision taking is played by intuitive judgment and the dominant role in creativity is played by intuitive insight we cannot conceptualize creativity involving intuition without coming to terms about delineating intuitive judgment from intuitive insight there are certain differences between intuitive judgment and intuitive insight the six characteristics of intuition outlined apply similarly the structure of intuiting as an integrative process applies in the case of intuitive judgment the decision aspects are tacitly integrated into a picture about what to do in the case of intuitive insight the components of the domain knowledge are tacitly integrated in a novel way producing knowledge that did not exist before we distinguish between intuitive judgment and intuitive insight this way of conceptualizing types of intuition takes an alternative perspective from the typologies available which is less well conceptualized than intuitive judgment. The main limitation of the present inquiry stems from the initial assumptions, namely that we have only examined intuitive knowledge and not the other three levels of intuitive awareness, physical, emotional and spiritual. Therefore the results only apply to intuitive knowledge. Additional research will be needed to understand the relationship between intuitive judgment and insight in the other three intuitive faculties. There may also be synergies between all four to be explored. Another potential limitation is the observation made earlier that there are many ways of distinguishing between kinds of intuition, several of which were mentioned. We chose to distinguish two kinds of intuition based on the areas in which intuition is used and have come up with a conceptual process to delineate between intuitive judgment and intuitive insight and also how to delineate these forms of intuition from their non-intuitive counterparts. Other ways of identifying kinds of intuition may lead to different results, and the relation of the present typology to other typologies could be of further interest. Apart from the future research directions directly arising from the limitations of the current research, there are also several obvious areas for exploring the relationships of the two types of intuition proposed here to other constructs in the area of intuition. We would like to provide a useful starting point all through the area of intuition. We would like to provide a comprehensive tool. We believe that better understanding of the role of intuition in creativity can be beneficial for knowledge-oriented organizations. This was brought to you by The Strange, The Bizarre, The Unusual, I Like It, on YouTube and Facebook. Listen to our podcast on any of these platforms, Inker, Breaker, Overcast, Pocket Casts, Radio Public, Spotify. Support us on Patreon, and check us out on Discord. All the links can be found in the description below. We thank you for your participation. If you enjoyed please like, subscribe, share, make comments. We love feedback.